How long are training sessions with my dogs? What kind of chickens do I recommend for first timers? And why don't we breed and raise our own meat birds instead of ordering Cornish crosses from a hatchery? We're going to dive into those questions and a whole lot more in today's episode of Ask Home Study. Hey everybody, it's time for Ask Home Study, the weekly video where we answer the questions that you've left on our channel. And I want to start off by saying today we have fewer questions than normal, so I spent the time I normally would talking and talking and talking. Uh, trying to set up for, remember this, the Home Study Podcast? <laughs> I'm trying to find a space since our original plan of setting up the studio for winter time. Uh, we're still living there, it's not going to work. Uh, so I'm trying to find a new space to set up for the podcast. So for those of you who are podcast listeners, who are wondering when is the Home Study Podcast going to come back? Are we going to do it again ever? There will be another Home Study Podcast. And... I am working on setting some stuff up. I'm trying to set up the computer and the microphones uh, in this space. It is not soundproof as I would like, but we're going to try to make do and come up with some kind of podcast to produce. Anyway, long story. Let's get into answering a few of your questions. We didn't have many this week, so we're just going to tackle the ones we had and be all done. The first question that we have is from Barefoot Backyard. Uh, they were wondering, so just like I mentioned at the outset, some of these questions are from older videos because we didn't have that many this week. Last week I announced that we were going to not be covering all the Ask Home Study questions anymore, just the best ones that I thought would be the most help to everybody and that we could really go in depth on. And the response was lots of people didn't leave good questions. <laughs> we did get a couple questions. So we're going to answer a couple of those Ask Home Study questions. But please don't be afraid to leave some really good Ask Home Study questions next week so we can dive in. We're going to choose at least two from every video from that week. So there's a good chance your question will be answered. All you have to do is leave the hashtag Ask Home Study along with your question. That way we can find it. So the first question from today is actually from a video from a couple weeks ago about dog training. Barefoot Backyard asks, how long are your training sessions? I was told maybe 15 to 20 minutes, but I also completely failed training with my second dog. So any tips for not getting frustrated with an extremely high energy dog, they also ask. So great questions. Uh, first off, let's talk about what training sessions, uh, how I handle training sessions. And I think the first key is to make sure you're starting with a dog who's ready to learn. So a dog who's ready to learn has not is not at full energy level, nor is it at full hunger level, nor is it being distracted unless you're working on distractions. So the first thing I do when I'm training my dogs here on the homestead, uh, I go, I feed them, I let them outside to go pee, to get a drink, to run around and play for a few minutes, to get a lot of that high energy out, which is one way to not get frustrated with an extremely high energy dog. Then maybe it's playtime. So instead of getting right into your training session, throw a ball, throw a stick, go for a little run, let them play with other dogs, let them get a lot of that energy out. It's much easier to train a tired dog than it is to train a super full of energy dog. So as you can imagine, all that takes a good amount of time. I don't consider that part of the training session. That's just part of your dog's life and they have to get outside, run and play, eat, just have a normal life, time to go pee, time to get drinks, then we're ready to train. When I actually start training my dogs to the time I'm done, usually is somewhere around 15 or 20 minutes. And that's because if you go too much longer than that, you're going to be doing too much. The dog won't be able to remember or comprehend really what you're trying to teach them. So you might lose, the kind of the whole point of doing that might be lost. Uh, so, yeah, I try to keep them short and frequent. If you can do it two, three times a day, shorter training sessions three times a day. With me, it's part of the feeding process. So every time I feed my dogs, I train my dogs. Even Bones, who is three years old, still gets training every time I feed him. And then my goal is to a third time in the day, in the middle of the day somewhere, do additional training. 
If my kids are outside, I can do some training with them. It's good for other people to train with your dog so they don't just listen to you. And as far as not getting frustrated with a high energy dog, again, let them play first. Th fetch them. I like to throw a ball or whatever they're retrieving down a hill so they have to come running back up the hill. That really wears them out quick. Once they're tired, they'll be easier to work with. Just like kids, I mean, you run your kids around and then you sit them down to do something and they're gonna be a lot easier to train or teach than when they're full of energy, which is why we with homeschool make sure we're doing our lessons later in the day after they've been able to play and get a lot of energy out. So hope that helps and uh, hope that covers your questions, Barefoot Backyard. Hope you can train your next dog better than the second one. This is another question from an older video because again, we didn't get very many questions for today. 10,000 subs with no vids asks, what are your opinions on chickens? What kind of chickens do you recommend for first timers? It's a great question. My opinion on chickens are they are a great first animal for the beginning homesteader, someone who's looking to get involved in living this kind of lifestyle. Chickens are forgiving to beginner mistakes. They are pretty hardy. They are quick to produce something that you like to eat, whether that be eggs or chicken meat. <laughs> They're all around a very great place to start. So what kind of chickens would I recommend for first timers? I would recommend if you want to do egg laying chickens, that you start with chickens that perhaps you could buy locally from a small farm that's selling chickens. Uh, if you can't buy them from someone locally who's producing a really a good purebred chicken where you know you're getting what you're looking for, whether that be uh, something like a Rhode Island Red or a Leghorn, uh, just kind of your basic egg laying chickens that a lot of people start with. Hampshire's are nice. Um, those are just a couple. If you like the green eggs, Aricanas and Americanas are fun. You can get some Marins, get some of those chocolate eggs. Those, those are just fun colors. Uh, but as far as egg layers go, I'd like to find somebody locally first who's producing good quality chickens that you know are the breed you're looking for. Uh, if you can't find that, then go with something from a hatchery. And if you're going from a hatchery, I recommend getting a couple different breeds. Try to get some of their steady, ready layers like the Leghorns and the Rhode Island Reds. You're gonna get a lot of eggs from them. And then maybe mix it up based off of color. Um, try to avoid, in the first time you ever get chickens, anything that's too different or too unique because they might have their own set of issues that you have to deal with. Bantams are gonna be smaller. Uh, something like a Silky would have a different way to handle it or manage it something with really big combs or, or a really small bird. Just avoid something that's too out of the ordinary when you're first getting started. Get something that's pretty standard and that way if it's not your cup of tea and you want to rehome your chickens, it's very easy to sell point of lay, Rhode Island Reds, Leghorns, New Hampshire's, whatever they are. It's pretty easy to get rid of a chicken like that. You can make a little bit of money. You might make all your money back if you sell point of lay hens. It's harder to get rid of something that's really different that people aren't looking for. Hope that helps. We do have a lot of playlists as uh, our super fan T. Roo mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of playlists that answer beginner questions beginner chicken questions. So go ahead and check those out. And uh, we have another good chicken qu question coming up today about meat birds. So when it comes to what kind of meat chickens you should get, save that for the question coming in just a little bit. This next question is a very scary question to get into at all because it, re it, it is about town codes and whether or not you should get animals. I've talked about this from time to time in the past. I'm not a big fan on all those regulations that hold people back from getting livestock. I think most of the regulations that keep people from getting livestock are kind of ridiculous, uh, unnecessarily uh, dominating over people who just want to have a couple of chickens. There are some good reasons you one could argue for having regulations when it comes to livestock. Certain places in town are just not a good place to keep a cow. Uh, but a lot of times I feel town regulations go overborn and I'm passionate about getting people started with 
self-sufficiency, raising their own food, getting involved with livestock, and this is one of the things that stops a lot of people. I was asked not too long ago by David Rudolph to help out, and while I'm not going to give him the answer he wants, which is, well, cut and dry, I do want to give some advice on navigating town codes and how to deal with things like this and what you should expect, because I have a lot of experience dealing with town health codes, inspectors, and that sort of thing. So let's get into David's question. He says his wife and him need some help. They want some animals, but they disagree on their specific town code. He thinks it's pretty cut and dry, but his wife says she can find a loophole. She wants goats. He says, I know, goats. <laughs> Maybe one day a family cow. I want donkeys, which should fall under the horse pony category. We have 2.75 acres. We had chickens and plan to get more sometime soon. Any help or advice you could give us in understanding it would be great. And then he gives us the town code. And so here's what I want to do with this question. I want to just help you all in general navigate town codes, know how they work, how inspectors will or won't work with you, just, just what to expect. So first let's talk about the town code. The town code is the end all everything until it isn't. Now, what do I mean by that? I used to work with my father in construction, and in particular, we worked with septic systems. And there are lots of very specific health codes regarding septic systems. And each town has a health inspector who comes out when you're there working on the septic system to make sure you meet those exact zoning codes. The town codes, he has the code book for the town, he has the state codes, he has all the specifics that you need to meet. And if he can point to that book, show you something you've done that doesn't match that book, and he says you need to change it so you match that book, he has absolute power, the state will back him up. If he's the town inspector, the state will back up that town inspector. Uh, you have no way of going against what's in that town code, black and white town code. What happens when it's not black and white? What happens when the town code says something slightly vague and you're trying to use common sense? Then we get into the realm of how does your inspector feel about you or what you're trying to do? Because the inspector has absolute power even when the town code isn't granting him that power because he has been granted the power from the town and from the state to make the decisions. And 95% of the time, even if the inspector says, I want you to do this and the book says you don't have to, you will have to do what the inspector says. They have more power than even the town code. Is that right? No. Is it fair that there are that they can enforce rules that they've made up if they're not in the town code? No, of course it's not fair. That's why the code exists. But it doesn't matter. I can tell you from lots of experience, the town inspectors and officials will have the final say. They're the people who are going to get you in trouble, or they're the people who are going to say, ah, go for it, no one cares. So, let's try to navigate this town code, remembering that ultimately your inspectors whoever the officials are that wind up getting complained to are going to be the ones who come out and give you a hard time for this. If they're cool people who are into local farms and local food, maybe they won't make a big deal if you meet the town code close enough. If they're pencil pushing, abusing power, you know, just they get all excited to be able to tell people no bureaucrat loving officials, then you might be in trouble. So what does the town code say? Well, David shows us, he says, farms, nurseries, truck gardens, and the keeping of livestock and poultry and forestry provided that any such use shall consist of three acres or more, exclusive of any required lot area for dwelling, and provided further that any greenhouses incidental thereto and any buildings in which livestock or poultry are kept are located not less than 50 feet from any property or street line, except that an aggregate of not more than 20 chickens, similar poultry, rabbits, or similar, similar animals may be kept on a smaller land area if kept in a building or enclosure located no less than 20 feet from any property or street line. So basically, what that's saying is you need three acres to have the bigger animals. 
with less land you can have chickens, similar poultry, rabbits, or similar animals. <laughs> And that's where we get into these issues with these town codes, where you just eh, have trouble. Okay, so, and then you still have to be not less than 20 feet from property lines. And then they say you can't process things, so we're going to keep moving on. The keeping and raising of one horse or pony for personal or family purposes as a pet on any lot having a minimum area of one acre and one additional horse or pony may be maintained on said lot for each additional acre contained in said lot all subject to the following conditions. Any horse or pony shall be main, main, so maintained shall be in the building or stable which shall be detached from the main building, at least 50 feet from any property line and 100 feet distant from any well, and manure shall be kept in a cover, watertight pit or chamber and shall be removed at least once a week. So they're saying you can have a pony if you do these things. The keeping and raising of one horse or pony for personal or family purposes as a pet on any lot having a minimum area of one acre and one additional horse or pony may be maintained on said lot for each additional acre contained in said lot. So they said, their code says for pet ponies and horses you may have one per acre as long as you meet the other rules. So David and his wife are trying to figure out she wants to get a goat. He says, no, it's cut and dry. We can either have chickens, similar poultry, rabbits, or similar animals, or we can have one horse or pony. He wants a donkey, which he thinks would fit under that. She wants a goat. <laughs> This is what this one is really brutal with like the technicalities. So there is not really clear cut answer for either of you. Similar animal, uh, horse or pony for personal use. A goat is not a horse or a pony. A goat is probably not similar to a rabbit or poultry. Neither is a donkey. A donkey is not a horse or a pony. So really, both of you, technically, any town of official who likes to say no to people with big dreams, and a lot of town officials like to say no to people, with that's why they became town officials. No offense if you're one of the good ones, but there are a lot of just a, people who love to say no out there who become town officials because of that. Um, Either of you would be in trouble for your pony or your goat because you could be told no at any time. So now you have to step back and say they also don't say specifically you can't. <laughs> and there is the spirit of the law which shows that a horse and a pony could be on your property. So could a goat? Probably. Could a uh, donkey? Probably. So where are you going to get into trouble? You're going to get in trouble in a couple different ways. Do you have any neighbors that really don't like you and really don't like your farm? Do you have a loud rooster who crows every morning and wakes a neighbor of yours up and maybe they've complained to you once in a while, like, ah, can't you get rid of those stinking chickens? If you have neighbors who don't like what you're doing, then they're looking for reasons to report you. And the minute they find that you have an animal that's not specifically allowed in the town code, they got you, and if they go and report you and you get one of those town officials who likes to say no, you're going to be in trouble. Now, your wife wants goats. You should have at least two minimum. You cannot have one goat. It will be very unhappy. Two is a bare minimum. I suggest three. We only have two right now, but that's well, actually, well, more on that later. Uh, we only have two right now but we will have more because we're going to be breeding our, our does and our plans are to keep three breeding goats. So really you should have three. You can't with the amount of land that you have, 2.7 acres. You couldn't have that many ponies. You probably can't have that many goats. Your family cow, I would never plan on bringing a family cow into that situation. Goats, you might be able to get away with two goats. And that's if you don't have neighbors who are going to give you a hard time and if your town is more lenient with agriculture. And the best way to find this out 
Maybe you have past experience with your town. Uh, maybe you have an area in town. Maybe you know of people who have goats. That Maybe you drive by their house. S just stop in and ask. Anybody you know who has a couple goats? Anybody you know has animals that I would specifically mention here? Do you see a lot of that around? Because I think, honestly, from the, the code and the spirit of this code, if you don't have neighbors who complain, you could probably get a couple goats and have them... If they'll let you have two horses on your land, then it seems very reasonable to have two much smaller, less manure, less mess, could be less noise if you don't get a noisy goat. So with that in mind, you might be able to get, get away with this. And even better, if you have a little barn or something that the goats are going to live in, and then maybe they're by a fence where they're not really visible, you probably would have no problem at all. But if you're going to go down that road of getting an animal that you can't really prove whether or not you're allowed to have, you're going to have to have an exit strategy. Because if a neighbor does complain and the town official shows up and says, hey, you, you're you not compliant, and you say, well, you know, we could have two horses. These are much smaller than horses. They can say to you, sorry, those aren't horses. Those are goats. And that's where this is really tricky. So what is my advice? My advice is you need to figure this one out on your own. I'm not going to say, yes, get a goat. I'm not going to say you can't have a goat. You need to figure out uh, spirit of the law, it seems like it's pro-agriculture, letting people have a couple animals, but what is your experience? What are your neighbors like? Uh, is someone going to complain? If that's the case, it would be a real bummer to get into goats, get the infrastructure set up, get everything you need, and then wind up having to get rid of them. My only suggestion, if you do go into the work to start getting these goats and going down that path, Think about what would you replace them with later, like a donkey, <laughs> that you would be allowed to have. But again, a donkey is also not a horse or pony. The, the, the best thing you could do to get a solid answer would to be actually, if, if you're afraid to go out on a limb here and just do it and see what happens, ask for forgiveness, not permission, uh, then ask for permission. <laughs> Go down to your town hall with this code. Show that you're an educated person who respects the code. Find your health, whoever it's the health department or the zoning department will usually handle these sort of things. Go in there with that code. Say, hi, we know about the code that allows us to have two horses. Uh, we would prefer to have two goats. And we just wanted to find out if that meets the code. And if you, you might find a health inspector or a town official who says, oh yeah, no, we have no problem with goats. They're, they're like small horses. Then you say, great, we talked to you. All right, great, well, thank you very much. Two years later, that person retires and a jerk moves in and he gets a complaint about your goats. You still might have to get rid of them. I know, I didn't give you a clear cut and try answer on this one. And I warned you I wasn't gonna give you the answer you wanted. But I figured maybe just that little bit of extra insight into how the town works, how the codes work, what you can expect, maybe will help David and his wife navigate the waters of getting goats or donkeys. Honestly, David, I know you know, you know my stance on goats, but I'm going to be straight with you here. I'd rather have goats than a donkey. Uh, to me, I just can't see the value in a donkey. But... At least goats give milk. I'm just saying. Sorry, David. Your wife's right now like hitting you going, see, I told you. Next question. Here's another older question that I added to today's because just short on questions. Samantha asked, what, would this, what was the size barn that we have? Would we change the layout if we could? How would we change the layout? She's designing a barn and she's been drawing different designs to figure out what would be best for us. I have not measured the barn, Samantha, sorry. I'm not gonna run outside to measure it right now because I'm making a video. But honestly, that doesn't matter. The size of my barn doesn't matter to you because you're designing your barn for your place. So my barn, don't worry about my barn. Let's talk about your barn and what I would suggest when you are designing a barn from scratch. I've done that. I've designed a barn from scratch and I've been pretty happy with the results. 
but I've also learned some things about the design process. So first off, anytime you're designing something from the homestead, design it four different ways. I know you have you draw a design and you like it and you think that's the one. Now take that one, put it in a folder or a binder and start from scratch, completely different design. Do that a third time and do it a fourth time and here's why. That design process, coming at it from different angles, redoing it multiple times, you will probably find your first design is no longer your favorite one. Your fourth might include bits and pieces from two and three. We did that with our apartment. We designed one. I was having a really hard time designing the first one. After that, I thought, oh man, now I have to design a second and third and fourth. That's my rule, so I did. The second design was worse. It was garbage. But there was one little element to it that we moved into design number three and number four, and it turned out number three was my absolute favorite, and that's what we currently live in, and I would be really bummed if we had only designed it once. So good on you for drawing different designs. Keep it up, come up with four final designs, and then present those to your friends, your family, whoever will listen, get their, their input, and you still might tweak things in the design process. Design it, design it, design it. You can never do that enough times. So what would I change about our layout and what do I suggest for you? Well, build the biggest barn you can afford because one thing about homesteading is if you get into it and you really like it, you're gonna grow. That's just how this works. Each year you're gonna get more stuff and you'll never ever say, boy, I wish this barn was smaller. <laughs> you will never say that. So that's why the size of my barn doesn't matter because build the biggest one you can afford and you can fit. And that's just my advice there more space the better. Two stories is great because you can store stuff up above and have animals below like we have. We got a hayloft up above and animals below. If you can't quite do two stories, build it as tall ceilings as you can because then you can put lofts, at least a loft to store hay. We did that at Squash Hollow. We had the hayloft and that was nice for storage. When you're designing the barn, design entrances on multiple sides so that you can come in certain ways and that animals can come in certain ways. Make sure there's partitions in there so that you can walk in and out of your barn without animals getting all over you. So make sure to design entrances and rooms that are for just people and then have entrances and stalls for just animals. I would make sure to put exits on all my stalls. That's one thing I would change. The current barn we have, there is one or two stalls that have smaller exits I would put big exits for bigger animals. Might be something we change in the future. Uh, make sure to have water there ready before you put the building up. So put in a water line, put in electric. Every barn will be better off with water and electric. And it is not hard to bury an outside electric wire to where you're gonna build, if it's a pole barn, your pole barn. And it's not hard to run a water line from your house to where the barn's gonna be and then put a frost-free hydrant. So at least in the center of your barn, you always will have electricity and water. That'll be very nice on those winter days. That'll be nice for smaller animals, newly born animals. So make sure to design that. Uh, when it comes to the layout itself, our barn is, uh, we have stalls on the side and a long pathway down the middle for people and animals kind of to work and it can be divided with gates. It's a really nice design having the stalls to the side. You can drive the a little 4x4 four four through there and add, you know, clean out your stalls and throw the poop right in the 4x4 four four and then take it out wherever you take your manure. Love that. Um, I would have had the doors going to the outside in this barn. I would make them bigger. Our doors to the outside are smaller. I would make every stall have a human door going out, at least human sized door. Ours don't have that and that's one of the things I wish it did. Uh, because like if you're cleaning you know, the inside of the barn you could just walk outside, dump water buckets outside. There's a lot of times you want to just walk outside of your stall. But that, that's a lot more doors, a lot more time, money when you're actually making the barn itself. So that's not always a good idea, or it doesn't always work for everybody, putting in that many doors. So that's kind of one of those things you can decide. Other than that, um, make sure just to, like I mentioned, have just human only space, a nice tack room where you have, you know, your supplies, 
It's really bad when you're storing like medical supplies in a barn and an animal busts into that and you don't know what it ate or got into. That's not something you want to happen. So have an area that's safe from the animals. Have areas with surfaces that are easy to clean if you're ever going to do milking because you want to be able to sweep you know whether your floor is going to have concrete or gravel i suggest concrete floors if you're designing a barn they're easier to clean you can put lots of bedding on top of them and still clean them out easily in the springtime gravel sand they don't drain with hay on top of them like you would think they would they get very mucked up manure and hay on top of gravel becomes this nasty clay-like clump and that's really hard to clean every year I would suggest doing a concrete floor in your barn. I would build a smaller barn with a concrete floor before I build a bigger one that didn't have a concrete floor. Just my opinion, but I really like having a hard concrete floor in my whole barn. It just makes cleaning and keeping things nice easier. Think about drainage when you're designing your barn. Are you going to put gutters on the barn and then get the water away? Where are you putting that barn? Make sure it's not in the lowest spot on your property because it will be mucky and nasty. That is a problem we have here that we're going to have to fix. Our barn is at the bottom of a hill and just right now we're talking about how are we going to get the water away. We're going to put possibly some gutters on the barn to take the rainwater away, but then the water coming down the hill, I'm going to have to do some kind of swale or curtain drain. So there is some water issues where we're at. So getting the, make sure the barn is, the water doesn't run into the barn, that it slopes away from the barn. Maybe you saw the video where we had a barn flood. All things to consider. Again, as far as size goes, build the biggest barn you can afford to build and that will fit on your property. Take advantage of height. If you can't do a double story barn, at least make the ceiling something like 10 or 12 feet, 14 feet. Even if you're not gonna put a second story, you can put lofts in the animal stalls and store hay up in the lofts. That's a nice way to take advantage of more storage. Stacking hay really high, you're always gonna use hay if you have livestock. I hope that advice helped you, Samantha. I hope there were some good tips in there for your designs. And if you have four designs to show them off, post them on the Homesteady Facebook page and get people's opinions. There's a lot of good people following us on Facebook that maybe could help you with your barn design. Hard to post them here to YouTube, so Facebook page is the place to go for that. Another question about the chickens we choose. Sambalina was recently watching an older video of ours. We were caring for new chicks and she noticed a trend with most homesteading YouTubers. Everyone seems to order big batches of chicks for meat birds. Why not breed and raise your own meat birds? It's more self-sufficient to raise your own. So great question, Sambalina. It is true, if your goal for your homestead is to be the most self-reliant, the most self-sufficient person you can be, then raising your own meat birds is the only solution. It's the only way to go. That's not our number one concern with our homestead. Our homestead was started to feed our family the food we like to eat at a price that we could afford, and that's still one of the major driving reasons why we homestead is to continue to feed ourselves what we like and for the price that we want to pay for it. We like eating the Cornish crossbirds. We also like, depending on the recipe and the preparation, those ranger birds. We also like using, you know, just egg laying birds. My wife just made, Kay just made a chicken and dumplings with some old hens that we had butchered not too long ago. It was amazing. Such good flavor, delicious tasting meat. The, the stock and the chicken and dumplings was awesome. But if we are cooking a dinner for our family, we want a big, fat chicken. And Cornish crosses make big, fat chickens. It's what they were bred to do. They're not a genetically altered animal, scientifically, you know, messing with their genes. They have been bred and like hybridized by crossbreeding different types of chickens to produce this kind of chicken. Uh, they don't breed true on their own, so you can't breed your own Cornish crosses. That makes them not very self-reliant of a choice when it comes to your meat. But we live in a day and age where I can order these birds and they can show up and then I can raise them outside, giving them the life I want to give them. 
and then getting the product I want. There is no heritage breed bird you can raise that will produce a carcass like a Cornish cross, and that's why you see lots of homestead YouTubers doing Cornish crosses or even those rangers. And quite frankly, while the ranger birds might be a little bit more athletic than a Cornish cross, they might look a little bit more than a chicken, more like a chicken you're used to, I think they're just kind of like a red looking Cornish cross. They get big, they get fat, they get lazy. They produce slower. I don't, I haven't been swept off my feet by the ranger birds. They're great, but if you're going that route, you might as well go the Cornish cross in my opinion. The heritage breed birds do not produce a big fat meaty chicken. They produce something that's tougher, with less meat, that takes much longer to produce. So if I'm going to bank every year on producing all my chicken for my family, I'm not going to put the energy into that. But when it comes to self-reliance and self-sufficiency, I do like to have a breed on the homestead that were we to get into trouble and need to just produce our own chicken from our own flock, we would have a breed that we could do that with. And that breed for us right now are the Sussex that you see my son raising. These Sussex birds are very good foragers. They grow very large in a reasonable amount of time. We have yet to eat one of them, but I, looking at these birds, I can see the size they grow. There will be lots of meat there. And we have a couple Sussex roosters and hens, so we can keep breeding them. We will eventually wind up uh, butchering some of those, trying them out, seeing what we think, and I'll be able to give you a much better um, thumbs up or thumbs down on the Sussex as far as homesteaders who want to be more self-sufficient. To date, I have not found a breed that I go to every time as far as my own self-sufficient meat flock. But I do think it's a good idea to have at least a couple of those in your barnyard, kind of dual purpose birds. Were something really bad to happen, there they'd be. You could breed your own. And chickens are one of the easiest animals to keep a male on the farm and suddenly go from like eight chickens to like a hundred chickens. It's not too hard to take four or five hens and in a matter of a month, have them get sit on a clutch. Two months time, you got yourself four hens with 12 each. Four times 12 is 48, and that's a lot of chicken. You'd have more roosters, more hens, another you know, six months for them to get mature. Within a year's time, that 50 birds could just become so many chickens. You'd be very self-sufficient. You'd have a lot of meat for yourself. So not a bad thing to keep on the homestead, just as a bit of a backup in case you were ever to need to only raise your own. John wants to know if Kay likes the mustache. It's a very different look. She says it is growing on her, but I think it's growing on me. But I'm just... Yeah, okay. Next question. A lot of people have asked, we'll have to do a video on this, we use these metal rolling steel carts in our feed room and a lot of people have asked about those. My father-in-law is a metal fabricator and he made those carts for my mother-in-law for her to be able to put feed into, rest bags on top of, easily open them up, scoop out the feed. They are rodent proof. They are rain, you know, moisture resistant, like rain's not gonna go through them. Uh, and they roll, so you can move them around the barn and, you know, okay, we're gonna set up the, the goats over here, let's roll the feed by the goats and we'll roll the chicken feed by the chickens. They're really, really nice design, really cool. You can't get them, they were made, custom made, so I'm sorry. A lot of people ask about them and I wanted to just answer that for all those people who've been wondering. But yeah, custom made, sorry. Maybe we could show them off in a video and if anyone knew a fabricator, you can ask a fabricator to make you a set. <laughs> Trade them for like a bunch of chicken or a, a pig or something. Speaking of giving people meat, Kelly was gifted some venison. She is clueless as to how to cook it, what are my favorite recipes, and she wants to be sure her family's first experience is a good one. So really good question, Kelly. I'm, it's exciting that you want to, you don't know how to, but you want to do right by it. 
Venison is awesome when you cook it properly. So first off, Kelly, let's talk about what cut did you get gifted? Did this person really like you? Now I'm gonna get this person either in trouble or I'm gonna get them like, they're gonna like look even better, we'll see. If they really are your friend and they were giving you a nice, nice gift, possibly they gave you some backstrap, which, or you might refer to the backstrap, uh, that is the meat running along the spine, it's the loin. That is really good quality meat. It is tender, it is delicious, it is easy to eat, it's the best cut. The tender loins, which run along the inside of the spine, are even better than that, but they are smaller. It's likely they didn't give you the tender loins. They're very small, there's just a little bit of them. Uh, unless they give you little mini T-bone steaks, then you probably didn't get any tender loin. That meat, you would want to cook very quickly, high heat seared on both sides, and then lower heat for another, just a little bit. You wanna see pink in the middle. Does that freak your family out? Do people not like to eat rare meat? Well, too bad. That's how you wanna eat venison steak. And if it weirds people out, make yourself a balsamic reduction and drizzle it on the meat so people can't tell that the color is the meat and not the balsamic reduction. And there you go. You've got wonderful venison. It isn't tough. It isn't gamey anymore. And if people don't like the, the rare presentation, well, you've covered it with a bit of sauce. They're none the wiser. If you overcook a nice cut like backstrap, or this same rule applies to any steaks from the hindquarters. If they gave you steaks from the hindquarters, like a rump roast or like where the sirloin is, any of those hindquarters steaks also should be cooked quickly, seared, rare in the center. If it is a thick cut and it's going to be hard to cook that way, butterfly it so it is thinner but longer and then you can get high heat with a pink center and still get everything up to temperature properly. If it's a big roast, I, I wouldn't cook it like a roast. I would stake that roast out because roasts are harder to do where you get the nice outside sear and then the inside just that nice pink center. I like to make venison thinner. Our steaks are about one inch. That way we can get the sear with the pink center, high heat, and not overcook it. Because as venison is a very dry meat, there's not a lot of fat in it. So if you cook it for a long time, you remove the moisture and it gets tough and then chewy, tough, and gamey. So your first venison steak's like a hockey puck and you're just like, why did they give us this? No, you don't want that to be your first experience with venison. So if it's a steak from the, the loin or the hindquarters, high heat, quick, thin cuts. If they give you a big old roast, make steaks and butterfly those steaks and that's a great way to go. As far as what to sear it in, you can cook it in butter, that's great. You can cook it on lard, a uh, little bit of olive oil. Just get that nice sear, some salt and pepper. Let the flavor of the meat shine through and if people are weirded out, a little bit of a balsamic reduction to hide the pink color. But don't try to take away, venison's delicious with just a little salt and pepper and proper cooking technique, you're going to enjoy it. It's very, very good, it's very lean, it's very healthy. It, my kids gobble it up. It's one of the favorite meals at our house, venison. Now, if this was a tough old buck, if this was something from the front of the deer, the muscle that has a lot more movement, more sinew, that kind of stuff should be ground up, turned into chili, sloppy joes, burger, anything like that. So. If they gave you burger already, and <laughs> cook it like burger, I would even go so far as to say, if you're going to grind up something that was tougher, um, or if it is already ground, add some pork fat to it. Grind it up with some pork fat. If you don't know how to do that, you know, a lot of times you can find a butcher who will take venison and, and grind it for you and add fat to it, then you can cook it like burgers. We cook our burgers like we do our steaks. High heat, good sear, pink center. Warm pink center. You don't want to overcook your venison burgers. If you really want to cook the heck out of your venison because you're scared of stuff like that, then turn it into something like a sloppy joe, which will have sauce to reconst reconstitute it, get it moist again. So you have your burger and you cook it and it dries out, but then you add a bunch of sauce and bread and cheese. That's not really enjoying venison as it should be. 
but if you're afraid to cook it as it should be cooked, that's an alternate option. I hope that advice helps you, Kelly, and tell us how dinner goes. I'd love to know if it turns out really, really good. If it's a good steak, remember, just a little salt, no, good amount of salt, a little bit of pepper, high heat, and let the venison speak for itself. It's delicious when prepared properly. One additional thing I gotta throw in there, if they were not a very picky butcher of their venison or if someone else butchered it and you see any kind of silver skin on the outside of that steak, shiny looking stuff that doesn't look like just red meat, cut that off. If there's white fat or sinew, cut that off, remove all that stuff. If they had a butcher do it, a lot of times butchers don't butcher deer like they should, like the Jay that's doing our videos. Um, a lot of butchers got it just for the sake of money and time, just quickly cross cut steaks. You'll have that sinew and that silver skin and that stuff tastes nasty. So cut that off before you cook your steak. All you wanna see is beautiful red meat cooked quickly on high heat. One more question about venison, and like I said, we didn't get many questions this week. Um, Brandy wanted to know, can you process a deer into smaller chunks and then age it in the refrigerator if you can't hang it like we saw at the beginning of the week when uh, I was, have, when I had our butcher demonstrating how to butcher a deer. So Brandy, great question. The answer is yes, absolutely. If you don't have a walk-in hanging cooler, you can age your venison in your refrigerator, but you have to do a couple of modifications. First off, make sure the temperature is gonna be somewhere, I believe Jay said it was like 34 to 36. You don't want it to freeze, and you don't want it to get too warm, so adjust the temperature on your refrigerator. I would not suggest doing this in the refrigerator that you use for everyday life, because you'll open the door a lot, and the smell of everything else in your fridge can be absorbed into that. Get yourself a small little aging refrigerator. Find a used refrigerator on Craigslist to convert into what you need. That's what we did. You can actually see a video on our channel. If you search on our channel, Aging Meat, you'll find the video where I did this exact thing. Put a fan in that refrigerator. Air circulating is good for the aging process. Put a pan in the bottom with like baking soda to absorb the drippings from the deer. You want that to get absorbed. You don't want that to rot in the bottom. Hang the meat on a little metal hook, suspend it from the top of your refrigerator and make sure it's not touching anything. If the meat touches the bottom of your refrigerator, liquid will pool there as it drips out and drains. And that pooling liquid will create like that suction liquid does. Bacteria can grow in there. It gets smelly, nasty, and you'll ruin your meat. I did that one year. The first year I tried to age a deer leg. I took one leg and I kind of like put it in the refrigerator and closed the door, not doing enough research, opened it up a couple days later and the smell was atrocious because it's just sitting in its own liquid. Germs are festering, it's, it's gross. So hang it, make sure it's completely up in the air, air is circulating, the drippings are being caught in a pan with like baking soda absorbing that smell and absorbing the liquid and then just leave it closed with the fan running and check on it, you know, you could check on it once every couple days, making sure the temperature is good, make sure you got a thermometer in there to know your temperature's right. You will lose, doing it that way, you will lose meat to what Jake referred to as exposed meat. The outer part of the steak will get hard, dark colored and cr like crispy, crunchy, but you'll cut that off and the meat in the center as long as it didn't get too warm and it wasn't pooled in any liquid, the bacteria can't grow in that controlled temperature, that 36 to 34 to 36 degrees. Harmful bacteria cannot multiply quickly at that temperature. So you don't have to worry about harmful bacteria as long as you keep your temperature steady. All that's gonna happen is the collagen in the meat itself is going to be getting digested by enzymes that are in that meat. When collagen is broken down, that makes a harder deer, a tougher deer, now like a softer meat. It's easier to cut, it's easier to chew, which is a nicer experience. There is an enhanced flavor to aged wild game that some people enjoy a lot more than non-aged game. I've done this with big bucks and it has produced a better product but it has not cured the problem of big buck meat. 
Uh, I'm yet to find the perfect way to handle big muck buck meat after 10 years and four nice bucks in that 10 years time. Um, I, every year I try something new with my big bucks. This year we're trying to just do the route of like making some meat sticks with a lot of spices, seeing if that does a better job. And I'll have an update on that soon. I'll be getting my meat back. But this can help for sure. I had the deer that Jay had been aging and you'll see it in the upcoming videos we're gonna release. I had some of that and it was tender, soft, and it had a very rich flavor to it. It is very, very nice. It's something you should try to do for sure. And it's something you can play around with. So put four or five steaks into your fridge there. And then after a week, take one out, trim it, process it, bag it. After two weeks, do one, same thing. After three weeks and four, and then compare them. Sit down to dinner with three friends, set it up as a blind taste test with flip over labels. Have your three friends, four friends, all say here's option A, option B, option C, taste it, write down what your favorite was on the one side of the, the card, and then flip them over and see, okay, wow, everybody at the table, their favorite was the meat that we aged three weeks, except for Uncle Bill, but, you know, he drinks Bud Light anyway, so we don't really care what Uncle Bill thinks. <laughs> Sorry, Bud Light drinkers. It's just a joke. Take it easy, guys. It's, drink whatever beer you like. The point is, find out what you like, experiment with it. It's one of the fun things about doing this, controlling your own meat. You can find out what you like. Just because somebody likes a 40-day aged steak doesn't mean that's what you're gonna like. Taste, taste is very subjective. You might find you like stuff that's fresher compared to the aged meat, or maybe not. Test and see what you like best, and let us know in the comments what you thought after you experiment with yours. As you know, we always tell you what we think in the videos that we make. And soon I'll be getting my buck back, which was aged and was heavily spiced up in the form of bologna and meat sticks. So I'm really excited to get that back and see what we think. And I just got a phone call. Maybe that was the butcher calling me now to tell me it's ready. I hope it is, because I'm getting hungry. We're gonna shut this week's Q&A down. This is kind of the idea we're gonna go with like eight, nine, 10 questions each week. You can give a little bit more time to each question hopefully without producing an episode that's two hours long. So be sure to leave some questions and next week, hashtag them, ask Homesteady so that we find them. And if you like what we do every week, five videos a week, including this one where we take the time to answer your questions, please consider becoming a Homesteady Pioneer. There's a link below to do that. It's $5 a month. There's a whole lot of bonus podcasts and videos and courses for Homesteady Pioneers. There's discounts to homesteading stuff you might want to buy anyway. All John Siskovich's books. You can get uh, trees for your orchard, berry bushes at a discount from Northeast Edible. There's a lot of stuff there. You can learn more about it by clicking that link below. And if you can't become a pioneer but you still want to support us, if you're shopping on Amazon, click on our link below to go to Amazon or the Amsteady links or just type in www.amsteady.com then that forwards you on to Amazon. It's a huge help to us being able to produce this show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in next week's videos.